Frankenstein, or The Modern Prometheus, by Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley. Introduction The publishers of the standard novels, in selecting Frankenstein for one of their series, expressed a wish that I should furnish them with some account of the origin of the story. I am the more willing to comply, because I shall thus give a general answer to the question so very frequently asked me. How I, when a young girl, came to think of and to dilate upon so very hideous an idea. It is true that I am very averse to bringing myself forward in print, but as my account will only appear as an appendage to a former production, and as it will be confined to such topics as have connection with my authorship alone, I can scarcely accuse myself of a personal intrusion. It is not singular that, as the daughter of two persons of distinguished literary celebrity, I should very early in life have thought of writing. As a child, I scribbled, and my favorite pastime during the hours given me for recreation was to write stories. Still, I had a dearer pleasure than this, which was the formation of castles in the air, the indulging of waking dreams, the following up of trains of thought, which had for their subject the formation of a succession of imaginary incidents. My dreams were at once more fantastic and agreeable than my writings. In the latter, I was a close imitator, rather doing as others had done, than putting down the suggestions of my own mind. What I wrote was intended at least for one other eye, my childhood's companion and friend. But my dreams were all my own. I accounted for them to nobody. They were my refuge when annoyed, my dearest pleasure when free. I lived principally in the country as a girl, and passed a considerable time in Scotland. I made occasional visits to the more picturesque parts, but my habitual residence was on the blank and dreary northern shores, northern shores of the Tay near Dundee. Blank and dreary on retrospection, I call them. They were not so to me then. They were the eyrie of freedom, and the pleasant region where unheeded I could commune with the creatures of my fancy. I wrote then, but in a most commonplace style. It was beneath the trees of the grounds belonging to our house, or on the bleak sides of the woodless mountains near, that my true comp compositions, the airy flights of my imagination, were born and fostered. I did not make myself the heroine of my tales. Life appeared to me too commonplace an affair as regarded myself. I could not figure to myself that romantic woes or wonderful events would ever be my lot, but I was not confined to my own identity, and I could, I could people the hours with creations far more interesting to me at that age than my own sensations. After this, my life became busier, and reality stood in place of fiction. My husband, however, was from the first very anxious that I should prove myself worthy of my parentage and enroll myself on the page of fame. He was forever enticing me to obtain literary reputation, which, even on my own part, I cared for then, though since I have become infinitely indifferent to it. At this time he desired that I should write, not so much with the idea that I could produce anything worthy of notice, but that he might himself judge how far I possessed the promise of better things hereafter. Still I did nothing. Traveling and the cares of a family occupied my time, and study in the way of reading or improving my ideas in communication with his far more cultivated mind was all of literary employment that engaged my attention. In the summer of 1816, we visited Switzerland and became the neighbors of Lord Byron. At first, we spent our pleasant hours on the lake or wandering on its shores, and Lord Byron, who was writing the third canto of Child Harold, was the only one among us who put his thoughts upon paper. These, as he brought them successively to us, clothed in all the light and harmony of poetry, seemed to stamp as divine the glories of heaven and earth, whose influences we took partook with him. But it proved a wet, ungenial summer and incessant rain often confined us for days to the house. Some volumes of ghost stories, translated from the German into French, fell into our hands. There was the history of the inconstant lover, 
who, when he thought to clasp the bride to whom he had pledged his vows, found himself in the arms of the pale ghost of whom, of her whom he had deserted. There was a tale of the sinful founder of his race, whose miserable doom it was to bestow the kiss of death on all the younger sons of his fated house, just when they reached the age of promise. His gigantic, shadowy form, clothed like the ghost in Hamlet in complete armor, but with the beaver up, was seen at midnight by the moon's fitful beams to advance slowly along the gloomy avenue. The shape was lost beneath the shadow of the castle walls, but soon a gate swung back, a step was heard, the door of the chamber opened, and he advanced to the couch of the blooming youths, cradled in healthy sleep. Eternal sorrow sat upon his face as he bent down and kissed the forehead of the boys, who from that hour withered like flowers snapped upon the stalk. I have not seen these stories since then, but their incidents are as fresh in my mind as if I had read them yesterday. We will each write a ghost story, said Lord Byron, and his proposition was acceded to. There were four of us. The noble author began a tale, a fragment of which he printed at the end of his poem, Mazeppa. Shelley, more apt to embody ideas and sentiments in the radiance of brilliant imagery and in the music of the most melodious verse that adorns our language than to invent, invent the machinery of a story, commenced one founded on the experiences of his early life. Poor Polidori had some terrible idea about a skull-headed lady who was so punished for peeping through a keyhole. What to see, I forget. Something very shocking and wrong, of course. But when she was reduced to a worse condition than the renowned Tom of Coventry, he did not know what to do with her, and was obliged to dispatch her to the tomb of the Capulets, the only place for which she was fitted. The illustrious poets also, annoyed by the platitude of prose, speedily relinqu relinquished their uncongenial task. I busied myself to think of a story, a story to rival those which had excited us to this task, one which would speak to the mysterious fears of our nature and awaken thrilling horror, one to make the reader dread to look around, to curdle the blood and quicken the beatings of the heart. If I did not accomplish these things, my ghost story would be unworthy of its name. I thought and pondered vainly. I felt that blank incapability of invention, which is the greatest misery of authorship, when dull nothing replies to our anxious invocations. Have you thought of a story? I was asked each morning, and each morning I was forced to reply with a mortifying negative. Everything must have a beginning, to speak in Sanchean phrase, and that beginning must be linked to something that went before. The Hindus give the world an elephant to support it, but they make the elephant stand upon a tortoise. Invention, it must be humbly admitted, does not consist in creating out of void, but out of chaos. The materials must, in the first place, be afforded. It can give form to dark, shapeless substance, but cannot bring into being the substance itself. In all matters of discovery and invention, even those even of those that appertain to the imagination, we are continually reminded of the story of Columbus and his egg. Invention consists in the capacity of seizing on the capabilities of a subject and in the power of molding and fashioning ideas suggested to it. Many and long were the conversations between Lord Byron and Shelley, to which I was a devout but nearly silent listener. During one of these, Various philosophical doctrines were discussed, and among others, the nature of the principle of life, and whether there was any probability of its ever being discovered and communicated. They talked of the experiments of Dr. Darwin. I speak not of what the doctor really did, or said that he did, but, as more to my purpose, of what was then spoken of, spoken of as having been done by him who preserved a piece of versimelli, vermicelli in a glass case, till, by some extraordinary means, it began to move with voluntary motion. 
Not thus, after all, would life be given. Perhaps a corpse would be reanimated. Galvanism had given token of such things. Perhaps the component parts of a creature might be manufactured, brought together, and endued with vital warmth. Night waned upon this talk, and even the witching hour had gone by before we retired to rest. When I placed my head upon my pillow, I did not sleep, nor could I be said to think. My imagination, unbidden, possessed, and guided me, giving the successive images that arose in my mind with a vividness far beyond the usual bounds of reverie. I saw, with shut eyes, but acute mental vision, I saw the pale student of unhallowed arts kneeling beside the thing he had put together. I saw the hideous phantasm of a man stretched out, and then, on the working of some powerful engine, show signs of life and stir with an uneasy, half-vital motion. Frightful must it be, for supremely frightful would be the effect of any human endeavor to mock the stupendous mechanism of the creator of the world. His success would terrify the artist. He would rush away from his odious handiwork, horror-stricken. He would hope that, left to itself, the slight spark of life which he had communicated would fade, that this thing, which had received such imperfect animation, would subside into dead matter, and he might sleep in the belief that si the silence of the grave would quench forever the transient existence of the hideous corpse which he had looked upon as the cradle of life. He sleeps, but he is awakened. He opens his eyes. Behold, the horrid thing stands at his bedside, opening his curtains and looking on him with yellow, watery, but speculative eyes. I opened mine in terror. The idea so possessed my mind that a thrill of fear ran through me, and I wished to exchange the ghastly image of my fancy for the realities around. I see them still, the very room, the dark parquet, the closed shutters with the moonlight struggling through, and the sense I had that the glassy lake and white high alps were beyond. I could not so easily get rid of my hideous phantom. Still, it haunted me. I must try to think of something else. I recurred to my ghost story, my tiresome, unlucky ghost story. Oh, if I could only contrive of one which would frighten my reader, as I myself had been frightened that night. Swift as light, and as cheering was the idea that broke in upon me. I have found it. What terrified me will terrify others and I need only describe the specter which had haunted my midnight pillow. On the morrow, I announced that I had thought of a story. I began that day with the words, it was on a dreary night of November, making only a transcript of the grim horrors of my waking dream. At first, I thought but of, but of a few pages, of a short tale, but Shelley urged me to develop the idea at greater length, I certainly did not owe the suggestion of one incident, nor scarcely of one train of feeling, to my husband, and yet, but for his incitement, it would have never taken the form which it was presented to the world. From this declaration, I must accept the preface that, as far as I can recollect, it was entirely written by him. And now, once again, I bid my hideous progeny go forth and prosper. I have an affection for it for it was the offspring of happy days, when death and grief but were but words, which found no true echo in my heart. Its several pages speak of many a walk, many a drive, and many a conversation, when I was not alone, and my companion was one who, in this world, I shall never see more. But this is for myself. My readers have nothing to do with these associations. I will add but one word as to the alterations I have made. They are principally those of style. I have changed no portion of the story, nor introduced any new ideas or circumstances. I have mended the language where it was so bald as to interfere with the interest of the narrative, and these changes occur almost exclusively in the beginning of the first volume. Throughout, they are entirely confined to such parts as are mere adjuncts to the story leaving the core and substance of it untouched. Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley, 
London, October 15, 1831. Preface The event on which this fiction is founded has been supposed by Dr. Darwin and some of the physiological writers of Germany as not of impossible occurrence. I shall not be supposed as according the remotest degree of serious faith to such an imagination. Yet, in assuming it as the basis of a work of fancy, I have not considered myself as merely weaving a series of supernatural terrors. The event on which the interest of the story depends is exempt from the disadvantages of a mere tale of specters or enchantment. It was recommended by the novelty of the situations which it develops, and, however impossible as a physical fact, affords a point of view to the imagination for the delineating of human passions more comprehensive and commanding than any which the ordinary relations of existing events can yield. I have thus endeavored to preserve the truth of the elementary principles of human nature, while I have not scrupled to innovate upon their combinations. The Iliad, the tragic poetry of Greece, Shakespeare in The Tempest and Midsummer Night's Dream, and most especially Milton in Paradise Lost, conform to this rule, and the most humble novelist who seeks to confer or receive amusement from his labors may, without presumption, apply to prose fiction a license, or rather a rule, from the adoption of which so many exquisite combinations of human feelings have resulted in the highest specimens of poetry. The circumstance upon which my story rests was suggested in casual conversation. It was commenced partly as a source of amusement and partly as an expedient for exercising any untried resources of mind. Other motives were mingled with these. As the work proceeded, I am by no means indifferent to the manner in which whatever moral tendencies exist in the sentiments or characters it contains shall affect the reader, yet my chief concern in this respect has been limited to the avoiding the enervating effects of the novel novels of the present day, and to the exhibition of the amiableness of domestic affection and the excellence of universal virtue. The opinions which naturally spring from the character and situation of the hero are by no means to be conceived as existing always in my own conviction, nor is any inference justly to be drawn from the following pages as prejudicing any philosophical doctrine of whatever kind. It is a subject also of additional interest to the author that this story was begun in the majestic reason, region where the scene is principally laid and in society which cannot cease to be regretted. I passed the summer of 1816 in the environs of Geneva. The season was cold and rainy, and in the evenings we crowded around a blazing wood fire, and occasionally amused ourselves with some German stories of ghosts, which happened to fall in, into our hands. These tales excited in us a playful desire of imitation. Two other friends, a tale from the pen of one, whom would be far more acceptable to the public than anything I can ever hope to produce, and myself agreed to write each a story founded on some supernatural occurrence. The weather, however, suddenly became serene, and my two friends left me on a journey among the Alps, and lost in the magnificent scenes which they present all memory of their ghostly visions. The following tale is the only one which has been completed. September 1817 Letter 1. To Mrs. Seville, England, St. Petersburg, December 11th, 17-something. You were rejoiced to hear that no disaster has accompanied the commencement of an enterprise which you have regarded with such evil forebodings. I arrived here yesterday, and my first task is to assure my dear sister of my welfare and increasing confidence in the success, success of my undertaking. I am already far north of London, and as I walk in the streets of Petersburg, I feel a cold northern breeze play upon my cheeks, which braces my nerves and fills me with delight. Do you understand this feeling, this breeze which has traveled from the regions towards, wh towards which I am advancing, gives me a foretaste of those icy climes, inspirited by this wind of promise. My daydreams become more fervent and vivid. 
I try in vain to be persuaded that the pole is the seat of frost and desolation. It ever presents itself to my imagination as the region of beauty and delight. There, Margaret, the sun is forever visible, its broad disk just skirting the horizon and diffusing a perpetual splendor. There, for with your leave, my sister, I will put some trust in preceding navigators, there snow and frost are banished, and, sailing over a calm sea, we may be wafted to a land surpassing in wonders and in beauty every region hitherto discovered on the habitable globe. Its productions and features may be without example, as the phenomena of the heavy bodies undoubtedly are in, are in those undiscovered solitudes. What may not be expected in a country of eternal light? I may there discover the wondrous power which attracts the needle, and may regulate a thousand celestial observations that require only this voyage to render their seeming eccentricities consistent forever. I shall satiate my ardent curiosity with the sight of a part of the world never before visited, and may tread a land never before imprinted by the foot of man. These are my enticements, and they are sufficient to conquer all fear of danger or death and to induce me to commence this laborious voyage with the joy a child feels when he embarks in a little boat with his holiday mates on an expedition of discovery of his native river. But, supposing all these conjectures to be false, you cannot contest the inestimable benefit which I shall confer on all mankind, mankind to the last generation by discovering a passage near the pole to those countries to reach, at pre to reach at present so many months are requisite, or by ascertaining the secret of the magnet, which, if at all possible, can only be effected by an undertaking such as mine. These reflections have dispelled the agitation with which I began my letter, and I feel my heart glow with an enthusiasm which elevates me to heaven, for nothing contributes so much to tranquilize the mind as a steady purpose a point on which the soul may fix its intellectual eye. This expedition has been the favorite dream of my early years. I have read with ardor the accounts of the various voyages which have been made in the prospect of arriving at the North Pacific Ocean through the seas which surround the pole. You may remember that a history of all the voyages made for purposes of discovery composed the whole of your, our good Uncle Thomas's library. My education was neglected, yet I was passionately fond of reading. These volumes were my study day and night, and my familiarity with them increased that regret, which I had felt as a child, on learning that my father's dying injunction had forbidden my uncle to allow me to embark on a seafaring life. These visions faded when I perused, for the first time, those poets whose effusions entranced my soul and lifted it to heaven. I also became a poet and lived for one year in a paradise of my own creation. I imagined that I might also obtain a niche in the temple where the names of Homer and Shakespeare are consecrated. You are well acquainted with my failure and how heavily I bore the disappointment. But just at that time I inherited the fortune of my cousin and my thoughts were turned into the channel of their earlier bent. Six years have passed since I resolved on my present undertaking. I can, even now, remember the hour from which I dedicated myself to this great enterprise. I commenced by inuring my body to hardship. I accompanied the whale fishers on several expeditions to the North Sea. I voluntarily endured cold, famine, thirst, and want of sleep. I often worked harder than the common sailors during the day and devoted my nights to the study of mathematics, the theory of medicine, and those branches of physical science from which a naval adventurer might derive the greatest practical advantage. Twice I actually hired myself as an undermate in a Greenland whaler, and acquitted myself to admiration. I must own I felt a little proud when my captain offered me the second dignity in the vessel, and entreated me to remain with the greatest earnestness. So valuable did he consider my services. And now, dear Mar Margaret, I do not deserve to do I not deserve to accomplish some great purpose? 
My life might have been passed in ease and luxury, but I preferred glory to every enticement that wealth placed in my path. Oh, that some encouraging voice would answer in the, infer in the affirmative. My courage and my resolution is firm, but my hopes fluctuate and my spirits are often depressed. I am about to proceed on a long and difficult voyage, the emergencies of which will demand all my fortitude. I am not required. I am required not only to raise the spirits of others, but sometimes to sustain my own when theirs are failing. This is the most favorable period for traveling in Russia. They fly quickly over the snow in their sledges. The motion is pleasant and, in my opinion, far more agreeable than that of an English stagecoach. The cold is not excessive if you are wrapped in furs, a dress which I have already adapted, for there is a great difference between walking the deck and remain in, remaining seated motionless for hours, when no exercise prevents the blood from actually freezing in your veins. I have no ambition to lose my life on the post road between St. Petersburg and Archangel. I shall depart for the latter town in a fortnight or three weeks, and my intention is to hire a ship there, which can be easily done by paying the insurance for the owner, and to engage as many sailors as I think necessary among those who are accustomed to the whale fishing. I do not intend to sail until the month of June, and when shall I return? Ah, dear sister, how can I answer this question? If I succeed, many, many months, perhaps years, will pass before you and I may meet. If I fail, you will see me again soon, or never. Farewell, my dear, excellent Margaret. Heaven shower down blessings upon you, and save me that I may again and again testify my gratitude for all your love and kindness. Your affectionate brother, R. Walton. Letter 2. To Mrs. Seville, England. Archangel. 28th March, 17-something. How slowly the time passes here, encompassed as I am by frost and snow. Yet a second step is taken towards my enterprise. I have hired a vessel, and am occupied in collecting my sailors. Those whom I have already engaged appear to be men on whom I can depend, and are all are certainly possessed of dauntless courage. But I have one want which I have never yet been able to satisfy, and the absence of the object of which I now feel as a most severe evil. I have no friend, Margaret. When I am glowing with the enthusiasm of success, there will be none to participate in my joy. If I am assailed by disappointment, no one will endeavor to sustain me in dejection. I shall commit my thoughts to paper, it is true but that is a poor medium for the communication of feeling. I desire the company of a man who could sympathize with me, whose eyes would reply to mine. You may deem me romantic, my dear sister, but I bitterly feel the want of a friend. I have no one near me, gentle yet courageous, possessed of a cultivated as well as of a capacious mind, whose tastes are like my own, to approve or amend my plans. How would, such a pair, uh, how would such a friend repair the faults of your poor brother? I am too ardent in execution and too impatient of difficulties, but it is a greater evil to me that I am self-educated. For the first fourteen years of my life, I ran wild on a common and read nothing but our Uncle Thomas's books of voyages. At that age, I became acquainted with the celebrated poets of our own country, but it was only when I had ceased to be in my power to derive its most important benefits from such a conviction, that I perceived the necessity of becoming acquainted with more languages than that of my native country. Now I am twenty-eight, and am in reality more illiterate than many schoolboys of fifteen. It is true that I have more thought, that I have thought more, and that my daydreams are more extended and magnificent, but they want, as the painters call it, keeping and I greatly need a friend who would have sense enough not to despise me as romantic, and affection enough for me to endeavor to regulate my mind. Well, these are useless complaints. I shall certainly find no friend on the wide ocean, nor even here in Archangel, among merchants and seamen. Yet some feelings 
unallied to the dross of human nature, beat even in these rugged bosoms. My lieutenant, for instance, is a man of wonderful courage and enterprise. He is madly desirous of glory, or rather, to word my phrase more characteristically, of advancement in his profession. He is an Englishman, and in the midst of national and professional prejudices, unsoftened by cultivation, retains some of the noblest endowments of humanity. I first became acquainted with him on board a whale vessel. Finding that he was unemployed in this city, I easily engaged him to assist in my enterprise. The master is a person of an excellent disposition, and is remarkable in the ship for his gentleness and the mildness of his discipline. This circumstance, added to his well-known integrity and dauntless courage, made me very desirous to engage him. A youth passed in solitude, my best years spent under your gentle and feminine fosterage, has so refined the groundwork of my character that I cannot overcome an intense distaste to the usual brutality exercised on board ship. I have never believed it, believed it to be necessary, and when I heard of a mariner equally noted for his kindliness of heart and the respect and obedience paid to him by his crew, I felt myself peculiarly fortunate in being able to secure his services. I heard of him first, in rather a romantic manner, from a lady who owes to him the happiness of her life. This, briefly, is his story. Some years ago, he loved a young Russian lady of moderate fortune, and having amassed a considerable sum in prize money, the father of the girl consented to the match. He saw his mistress once before the destined ceremony, but she was bathed in tears and, throwing himself at his feet, entreated him to spare her, confessing at the same time that she loved another, but that he was poor, and that her father would never consent to the union. My generous friend reassured the suppliant, and on being informed of the name of her lover, instantly abandoned his pursuit. He had already bought a farm with his money, <coughs> on which he had designed to pass the remainder of his life, but he bestowed the whole on his rival, together with the remains of his prize money to purchase stock, and then himself solicited the young woman's father to consent to her marriage with her lover. But the old man decidedly refused, thinking himself bound in honor to my friend, who, when he found the father inexorable, quitted his country, nor returned until he heard that his former mistress was married according to her inclinations. "'What a noble fellow!' he will exclaim. "'He is so. But then he is wholly uneducated. He is as silent as a Turk, and a kind of ignorant carelessness attends him, which, while it renders his conduct the more astonishing, detracts from the interest and sympathy which otherwise he would command. Yet do not suppose, because I complain a little, or because I can conceive a consolation for my toils, which I may never know, that I am wavering in my resolutions. Those are as fixed as fate, and my voyage is only now delayed until the weather shall permit my embarkation. The winter has been dreadfully severe, but the spring promises well, and it is considered as a remarkably early season, so that perhaps I may sail sooner than I expected. I shall do nothing rashly. You know me sufficiently to confide in my prudence and considerateness whenever the safety of others is committed to my care. I cannot describe to you my sensations on the near prospect of my undertaking. It is impossible to communicate to you a conception of the trembling sensation half pleasurable and half fearful, with which I am preparing to depart. I am going to unexplored regions, to the land of mist and snow, but I shall kill no albatross, therefore do not be alarmed for my safety. Or, if I should come back to you as worn and woeful as the ancient mariner, will you smile at my illusion? But I will disclose a secret. I often, I have often attributed my attachment to my passionate enthusiasm for the dangerous mysteries of the ocean to that production of the most imaginative of modern poets. There is something at work in my soul which I do not understand. I am practically industrious, painstaking, a workman to execute with perseverance and labor. labor. But besides this, there is a love for the marvelous, 
a belief in the marvelous, intertwined with all in all my projects, which hurries me out of the common pathways of men, even to the wild sea and unvisited regions I am about to explore. But to return to dearer considerations, shall I meet you again after having traversed immense seas and returned by the most southern cape of Africa or America? I dare not expect such success, yet I cannot bear to look upon the reverse of the picture. Continue, for the present, to write to me by every opportunity. I may receive your letters on some occasions when I need them most to support my spirits. I love you very tenderly. Remember me with affection, should you never hear from me again. Your affectionate brother, Robert Walton. Letter 3 to Mrs. Saville, England. My dear sister, July 7th, 17 something. I write a letter, uh, I write a few lines in haste to say that I am safe and well advanced on my voyage. This letter will reach England by a merchantman now on its homeward voyage from Archangel. More fortunate than I, who may not see my maid of land, perhaps, for many years. I am, however, in good spirits. My men are bold and apparently firm of purpose. Nor do the floating sheets of ice that continually pass us, indicating the dangers of the region towards which we are advancing, appear to dismay them. We have already reached a very high latitude, but it is the height of summer, and although not so warm as in England, the southern gales which blow us speedily towards those shores which I so ardently desire to attain breathe a degree of renovating warmth from which I had not expected. No incidents have hitherto befallen us that would make a figure in a letter. One or two stiff gales and the springing of a leak are accidents which experienced navigators scarcely remember to record, and I shall be well content if nothing worse happens to us during our voyage. Adieu, my dear Margaret. Be assured that for my own sake, as well as yours, I will not rashly encounter danger. I will be cool, persevering, and prudent. But success shall crown my endeavors. Wherefore not? Thus far I have gone, tracing a secure way over the pathless seas, the very stars themselves being witness and testimonies of my triumph. Why not still proceed over the untamed yet obedient element? What can stop the determined heart and resolved will of man? My swelling heart involuntarily pours itself out thus, but I must finish. Heaven bless my beloved sister, R.W. Letter 4. To Mrs. Seville, England. August 5th, 17-something. So strange an accident has happened to us that I cannot forbear recording it, although it is very probable that you will see me before these papers can come into your possession. Last Monday, July 31st, we were nearly surrounded by ice, which closed in on the ship on all sides, scarcely leaving her sea room in which she floated. Our situation was somewhat dangerous, especially as we were encompassed round by a very thick fog. We accordingly lay to and hoped that some charge would change would take place in the atmosphere and weather. About two o'clock, the mist cleared away, and we beheld, stretched out in every direction, vast and irregular plains of ice, which seemed to have no end. Some of my comrades groaned, and my own mind began to grow watchful with anxious thoughts, when a strange sight suddenly attracted our attention, and diverted our solicitude from our own situation. We perceived a low carriage, fixed on a sledge and drawn by dogs, pass on towards the north, at the distance of half a mile. A being which had the shape of a man, but apparently of gigantic stature, sat in the sledge and guided the dogs. We watched the rapid progress of the traveler with our telescopes until he was lost among the distant inequalities of the ice. This appearance excited our unqualified wonder. We were, as we believed, many hundred miles from land, but this apparition seemed to denote that it was not, in reality, so distant as we had supposed. Shut in, however, by ice, it was impossible to follow his track, which we had observed with the greatest attention. About two hours after this occurrence, we heard the ground sea, and before the night, before night the ice broke and freed our ship. 
We, however, lay to until the morning, fearing to encounter in the dark those large, loose masses which float about after the breaking up of the ice. I profited from this time to rest for a few hours. In the morning, however, as soon as it was light, I went upon deck and found all the sailors busy on one side of the vessel, apparently talking to someone in the sea. It was, in fact, a sledge like that we had seen before, which had drifted toward us in the night on a large fragment of ice. Only one dog remained alive, but there was a human being within it, whom the sailors were persuading to enter, enter the vessel. He was not, as the other traveler seemed to be, a savage inhabitant of some undiscovered land, uh, undiscovered island, but a European. When I appeared on deck, the master said, Here is our captain, and he will not allow you to perish on the open sea. On perceiving me, the stranger addressed me in English, although with a foreign accent. Before I come on board your vessel, said he, will you have the kindness to inform me whither you are bound? You may conceive my astonishment on hearing such a question addressed to me from a man on the brink of destruction, and to whom I should have supposed that my vessel would have been a resource which he would not have exchanged for the most precious wealth the earth can afford. I replied, however, that we were on a voyage of discovery towards the northern pole. Upon hearing this, he appeared satisfied and consented to come on board. Good God, Margaret, if you had seen the man who thus capitulated for his safety, your surprise would have been boundless. His limbs were nearly frozen, and his body dreadfully emaciated by fatigue and suffering. I never saw a man in so wretched a condition. We attempted to carry him into the cabin, but as soon as he had quitted the fresh air, he fainted. We accordingly brought him back to the deck and restored him to an animation by rubbing him with brandy and forcing him to swallow a small quantity. As soon as he showed signs of life, we wrapped him up in blankets and placed him near the chimney of the kitchen stove. By slow degrees, he recovered and ate a little soup, which restored him wonderfully. Two days passed in this manner before he was able to speak, and I often feared that his sufferings had deprived him of understanding. When he had in some measure recovered, I removed him to my own cabin and attended on him as much as my duty would permit. I never saw a more interesting creature. His eyes have generally an expression of wildness and even madness, but there are moments when, if anyone performs an act of kindness towards him, or does him any the most trifling service, his whole countenance is lighted up, as it were, with a beam of benevolence and sweetness that I never saw equaled. But he is generally melancholy and despairing, and sometimes he gnashes his teeth, as if impatient of the weight of woes that oppresses him. When my guest was a little recovered, I had great trouble to keep off the men, who wished to ask him a thousand questions, but I would not allow him to be tormented by their idle curiosity. In a state of body and mind whose restoration evidently depended upon entire repose, once, however, the lieutenant asked why he had come so far upon the ice in so strange a vehicle. His countenance instantly assumed an aspect of the deepest gloom and he replied, To seek one whom fled from me. And did the man whom you pursued travel in the same fashion? Yes. Then I fancy we have seen him, for the day before we picked you up, we saw some dogs drawing a sledge with a man in it across the ice. This aroused the stranger's attention, and he asked a multitude of questions concerning the route which the daemon, as he called him, had pursued. Soon after, when he was alone with me, he said, I have, doubtless, excited your curiosity, as well as that of these good people, but you are too considerate to make inquiries. Certainly, it would indeed be very impertinent and inhumane of me to, con to trouble you with any inquisitiveness of mine. And yet, you rescued me from a strange and perilous situation. You have benevolently, benevolently restored me to life. Soon after this, he inquired if I thought that the breaking up of the ice had destroyed the other sledge. I replied that I could not answer with any degree of certainty, for the ice had not broken until midnight, and the traveler might, had arrive, might have arrived at a place of safety before that time, but of this I could not judge. From this time, a new spirit of life animated the decaying frame of the stranger. 
he manifested the greatest eagerness to be upon deck to watch for the sledge which had appeared before. But I have persuaded him to remain in the cabin, for he is far too weak to sustain the rawness of the atmosphere. I have promised that someone should watch for him and give him instant notice if any new object should appear in sight. Such is my journal of what relates to this strange occurrence up to the present day. The stranger has gradually improved in health, but is very silent and appears uneasy when anyone except myself enters his cabin. Yet his manners are so conciliating and gentle that the sailors are all interested in him, although they have had very little communication with him. For my own part, I begin to love him as a brother, and his constant and deep grief fills me with sympathy and compassion. He must have been a noble creature in his better days, being even now in wreck so attractive and amiable. I said in one of my letters, my dear Margaret, that I should find no friend on the wide ocean. Yet I have found a man who, before his spirit had been broken by misery, I should have been happy to have possessed as the brother of my heart. I shall continue my journal concerning the stranger at intervals, should I have any fresh incidents to record. August 13th, 17-something. My affection for my guest increases every day. He excites at once my admiration and my pity to an astonishing degree. How can I see so noble a creature destroyed by misery without feeling the most poignant grief? He is so gentle, yet so wise. His mind is so cultivated, and when he speaks, although his words are culled with the choicest art, yet they flow with rapidity and unparalleled eloquence. He is now much recovered from his illness and is continually on the deck, apparently watching for the sledge that preceded his own. Yet, although unhappy, he is not so utterly occupied by his own misery, but that he interests himself deeply in the projects of others. He has frequently conversed with me on mine, which I have communicated to him without disguise. He entered attentively into all my arguments in favor of my eventual success, and to every minute detail of the measures I have taken to secure it. I was easily led by the sympathy which he evinced, to use the language of my heart, to give utterance to the burning ardor of my soul, and to say, with all the fervor that warmed me, how gladly I would sacrifice my fortune, my existence, my every hope to the farthest of my enterprise. One man's life or death were but a small price to pay for the acquirement of the knowledge which I sought, for the dominion I should acquire and transmit over the elemental foes of our race. As I spoke, a dark gloom spread over my listener's countenance. At first, I perceived that he tried to suppress his emotion. He placed his hands before his eyes, and my voice quivered and failed me, as I beheld tears trickle fast from between his fingers. A groan burst from his heaving breast. I paused. At length, he spoke in broken accents. Unhappy man, do you share my madness? Have you drank also of the intoxicating draught? Hear me, let me review my tale, and you will dash the cup from your lips. Such words, you may imagine, strongly excited my curiosity, but the paroxysm of grief that had seized the stranger overcame his weakened powers, and many hours of repose and tranquil conversation were necessary to restore his composure. Having conquered the violence of his feelings, he appeared to despise himself for being the slave of passion, and quelling the dark tyranny of despair, he led me again to converse concerning myself personally. He asked me the history of my earlier years. The tale was quickly told, but it awakened various trains of reflection. I spoke of my desire of finding a friend, of my thirst for a more intimate sympathy with a fellow mind than had ever fallen to my lot and expressed my conviction that a man could boast of little happiness who did not enjoy this blessing. I agree with you, replied the stranger. We are unfashioned creatures, but half made up. If one wiser, better, dearer than ourselves, such a friend ought to be. Do not lend his aid to perfectionate our weak and faulty natures. I once had a friend, the most noble of human creatures, and am entitled entitled, therefore, to judge respecting friendship. You have hope, and the world before you, and have no cause for despair. But I, 
I have lost everything and cannot begin life anew. As he said this, his countenance became expressive of a calm, settled grief that touched me to the heart. But he was silent and presently retired to his cabin. Even broken in spirit as he is, no one can feel more deeply than he does the beauties of nature, the starry sky, the sea, and every night afforded by these wonderful regions, still seems still to have the power of elevating his soul from earth. Such a man has a double existence. He may suffer misery and be overwhelmed by disappointments. Yet when he was retired into himself, he will be, take, he will be like a celestial spirit, that has a halo around him, within whose circle no grief or folly ventures. Will you smile at the enthusiasm I express concerning this divine wanderer? You would not, if you saw him. You have been tutored and refined by books and refinement from the world, and you are, therefore, somewhat fastidious, but this only renders you the more fit to appreciate the extraordinary merits of this wonderful man. Sometimes I have endeavored to discover what quality it is which he possesses that elevates him so immeasurably above any other person I ever knew. I believe it to be an intuitive discernment, a quick but never-failing power of judgment, a penetration into the causes of things, unequaled for clearness and precision. Add to this, add to this a facility of expression and a voice whose varies in, varied intonations our soul subduing music. August 19th, 17 something. Yesterday, the stranger said to me, You may easily perceive, Captain Walton, that I have suffered great and unparalleled misfortunes. I had determined at one time that the memory of these evils should die with me. But you have won me to alter my determination. You seek for knowledge and wisdom, as I once did and I ardently hope that the gratification of your wishes may not be a serpent to sting you as mine has been. I do not know that the relation of my disasters will be useful to you, yet when I reflect that you are pursuing the same course, exposing yourself to the same dangers which have rendered me what I am, I imagine that you may deduce an apt moral from my tale. One that may direct you if you succeed in your undertaking and console you in case of failure. Prepare to hear of occurrences which are usually deemed marvelous. We are among, were we among the tamer scenes of nature, I might fear to encounter your unbelief, perhaps your ridicule. But many things will appear possible in these wild and mysterious regions which would provoke the laughter of those unacquainted with the ever varied powers of nature. Nor can I doubt but that my tale conveys in its series internal evidence of the truth of the events of which it is composed. You may easily imagine that I was much gratified by the offered commun communication, yet I could not endure that he should renew his grief by a recital of his misfortunes. I felt the greatest eagerness to hear the promised narrative, partly from my curiosity and partly from a strong desire to ameliorate his fate if it were in my power. I expressed these feelings in my answer. I thank you, he replied, for your sympathy, but it is useless. My fate is nearly fulfilled. I wait but for one event, and then I shall repose in peace. I understand your feeling, continued he, perceiving that I wished to interrupt him, but you are mistaken, my friend. If thus you will allow me to name you, nothing can alter my destiny. Listen to my history, and you will perceive how irrevocably it is determined. He then told me that he would commence his narrative the next day, when I should be at leisure. This promise drew for me the warmest thanks. I have resolved every night, when I am not imperatively occupied by my duties, to record as nearly as possible in his own words what he has related during the day. If I should be engaged, I will at least make notes. This manuscript will doubtless afford you the greatest pleasure, but to me, who know him, and who hear it from his own lips, with what interest and sympathy shall I read it in some future day? Even now, as I commence my task, his full-toned voice swells in my ears, his lustrous eyes dwell upon me with all their melancholy sweetness, 
I see his thin hand raised in animation, while the liniments of his face are irradiated by the soul within. Strange and harrowing must be his story, frightful the storm which embraced the gallant vessel on its course and wrecked it thus. Chapter 1 I am by birth a Genovese, and my family is one of the most distinguished of that republic. My ancestors had been for many years counselors and syndics, and my father had filled several public situations with honor and reputation. He was respected by all who knew him for his integrity and indefatigable, indefatigable attention to public business. He passed his younger days perpetually occupied by the affairs of his country. A variety of circumstances had prevented his martyr marrying early, nor was it until the decline of his life that he became a husband and the father of a family. As the circumstances of his marriage illustrate his character, I cannot refrain from relating, re relating them. One of his most intimate friends was a merchant who, from a flourishing state, fell through numerous mischances into poverty. This man, whose name was Beaufort, was of a proud and unbending disposition, and, can, and could not bear to live in poverty and oblivion in the same country where he had formerly been distinguished for his rank and magnificence. Having paid his debts, therefore, in the most honorable manner, he retreated with his daughter to the town of Lucerne, where he lived unknown and in wretchedness. My father loved Beaufort with the truest friendship, and was deeply grieved by his retreat in these unfortunate circumstances. He bitterly deplored the false pride which led his friend to a conduct so little worthy of the affection that united them. He lost no time in endeavoring to seek him out, with the hope of persuading him to begin the world again through his credit and assistance. Beaufort had taken effectual measures to conceal himself, and it was ten months before my father discovered his abode. Overjoyed at this discovery, he hastened to the house, which was situated in a mean street near the roofs. But when he entered, misery and despair alone welcomed him. Beaufort had saved but a very small sum of money from the wreck of his fortunes, but it was sufficient to provide him with sustenance for some months and in the meantime he hoped to procure some respectable employment in a merchant's house. The interval was, consequently, spent in inaction. His grief only became more deep and rankling. When he had leisure for reflection, and at length it took so fast hold of his mind, that at the end of three months he lay on a bed of sickness, incapable of any exertion. His daughter attended him with the greatest tenderness, but she saw with despair that their little fund was rapidly decreasing, and that there was no other prospect for support. But Caroline, Caroline Beaufort, possessed a mind of an uncommon mold, and her courage rose to support her in her adversity. She procured plain work, she plaited straw, and by various means contrived to earn a pittance scarcely sufficient to support life. Several months passed in this manner. Her father grew worse. Her time was more entirely occupied in attending him. Her means of subsistence decreased, and in the tenth month her father died in her arms, leaving her an orphan and a beggar. This last blow overcame her, and she knelt by... Beaufort's coffin, weeping bitterly, when my father entered the chamber. He came like a protecting spirit to the poor girl, who committed herself to his care, and after the interment of his friend, he conducted her to Geneva, and placed her under the protection of a relation. Two years after this event, Caroline became his wife. There was a considerable difference between the ages of my parents, but this circumstance seemed to unite them only closer in bonds of devoted affection. There was a sense of justice in my father's upright mind, which rendered it necessary that he should approve highly to love strongly. Perhaps during former years he had suffered from the late discovered unworthiness of one beloved, who, was, who so was disposed to set a greater value on tried worth. There was a show of gratitude and worship in his attachment to my mother, differing wholly from the doting fondness of age. 
for it was inspired by reverence for her virtues and a desire to the, be the means of, in some degree, recompensing her for the sorrows she had endured, but which gave inexpressible grace to his behavior to her. Everything was made to yield to her wishes and her convenience. He strove to shelter her as a fair exotic is sheltered by the gardener from every rougher wind, and to surround her with all that could tend to excite, excite pleasurable emotion in her soft and benevolent mind. Her health, and even the tranquility of her hitherto constant spirit, had been shaken by what she had gone through. During the two years that elapsed previous to their marriage, my father had gradually relinquished all his public functions, and immediately, immediately after their union, they sought the pleasant climate of Italy, and the change of scene and interest in attendant on a tour through that land of wonders, and as a restorative for her weakened frame. From Italy they visited Germany and France. I, their eldest child, was born at Naples, and as an infant accompanied them in their rambles. I remained for several years their only child. Much as they were attached to each other, they seemed to draw inexhaustible stores of affection from a very mine of love to bestow them upon me. My mother's tender caresses and my father's smile of benevolent pleasure while regarding me are my first recollections. I was their plaything and their idol, and something better, their child. The innocent and helpless creature bestowed on them by heaven, whom to bring up to good and whose futures future lot it was there in their hands to direct to happiness or misery, according as they fulfilled their duties towards me. With this deep consciousness of what they owed towards the being to which they had given life, added to the active spirit of tenderness that animated both, it may be imagined that while during every hour of my infant life I received a lesson of patience, of charity, and of self-control. I was so guided by a silken cord that all seemed but one train of enjoyment to me. For a long time, I was their only care. My mother had much desired to have a daughter, but I continued their single offspring. When I was about five years old, while making, a, making an excursion beyond the frontiers of Italy, they passed a week on the shores of Lake Como. Their benevolent disposition often made them enter the cottages of the poor. This, to my mother, was more than a duty. It was a necessity, a passion. Remembering what she had suffered and how she had been relieved, for her to act in her turn the guardian angel to the afflicted. During one of their walks, a poor cot in the foldings of a veil attracted their notice, as being singularly disconsolate. While a number of half-clothed children gathered about it, spoke of penury in its worst shape. One day, when my father had gone by himself to Milan, my mother, accompanied by me, visited this abode. She found a peasant and his wife, hard-working, bent down by care and labor, distributing a scanty meal to five hungry babes. Among these, there was one which attracted my mother far above all the rest. She appeared of a different stock. The four others were dark-eyed, hardy little vagrants. This child was thin and very fair. Her hair was the brightest living gold, and despite the poverty of her clothing, seemed to set a crown of distinction upon her head. Her brow was clear and ample, her blue eyes cloudless, and her lips and the molding of her face so expressive of sensibility and sweetness that none could behold her without looking on her as, a, as of a distinct species, a being heaven-sent and bearing a celestial stamp in all her features. The peasant woman, perceiving that my mother fixed eyes of wonder and admiration on this lovely girl, eagerly communicated her history. She was not her child, but the daughter of a Milanese nobleman. Her mother was a German and had died on giving her birth. The infant had been placed with these good people to nurse. They were better off then. They had not been long married, and their eldest child was just born. The father of their charge was one of those Italians nursed by, in the memory of the antique glory of Italy. One among the 
Shiavi Agnor Fermenti, who exerted himself to obtain the liberty of his country. He became the victim of his weakness. Whether he had died or still lingered in the dungeons of Austria was not known. His property was confiscated. His child became an orphan and a beggar. She continued with her foster parents and bloomed in their rude abode, fairer than a garden rose among dark-leaved brambles. When my father returned from Milan, he found playing with me in the hall of our villa a child fairer than pictured cherub, a creature who sh seemed to shed radiance from her looks, and whose form and motions were lighter than the chamois of the hills. The apparition was soon explained. With his permission, my mother prevailed upon her rustic guardians to yield their charge to her. They were fond of the sweet orphan. Her presence had seemed a blessing to them. But it would be unfair to keep her in poverty and want when Providence afforded her such powerful protection. They consulted their village priest, and the result was that Elizabeth Lavenza became the intimate inmate of my parents' house, my more than sister, the beautiful and adored companion of all my occupations and my pleasures. Everyone loved Elizabeth. The passionate and almost reverential attachment with which all regarded her became, while I shared it, my pride and my delight. On the evening previous to her being brought to my home, my mother had said playfully, I have a pretty, I have a pretty present for my victor. Tomorrow he shall have it. And when, on the morrow, she presented Elizabeth to me as her promised gift, I, with childish seriousness, interpreted her words literally, and looked upon Elizabeth as mine, mine to protect, love, and cherish. All praises bestowed upon her I received as made to a possession of my own. We called each other familiarly by the name of cousin. No word, no expression could body forth the kind of relation in which she stood to me, my more than sister, since till death she was to be mine only. Chapter 2 We were brought up together. There was not quite a year difference in our ages. I need not say that we were strangers to any species of disunion or dispute. Harmony was the soul of our companionship and the diversity and contrast that subsisted in our characters drew us nearer together. Elizabeth was of a calmer and more concentrated disposition, but with all my ardour I was capable of a more intense application, and was more deeply smitten with the thirst for knowledge. She busied herself with following the aerial creations of the poets, and in the majestic and wondrous scenes which surrounded our Swiss home. The sublime shapes of the mountains, the changes of the seasons, tempest and calm, the silence of winter, and the life and turbulence of our alpine summers. She found ample scope for admiration and delight, while my companion contemplated with a serious and satisfied spirit the magnificent appearances of things, I delighted in investigating their causes. The world was to me a secret which I desired to divine. Curiosity, earnest research to learn the hidden laws of nature, gladness akin to rapture as they were unfolded to me, are among the earliest sensations I can remember. On the birth of a second son, my junior by seven years, my parents gave up entirely their wandering life and fixed themselves and their selves in their native country. We possessed a house in Geneva and a campagna on Belrive, the eastern shore of the lake, at the distance of rather more than a league from the city. We resided principally in the latter, and the lives of my parents were passed in considerable seclusion. It was my temper to avoid a crowd and to attach myself fervently to a few. I was indifferent, therefore, to my schoolfellows in general but I united myself in the bonds of the closest friendship to one among them. Henry Clerval was the son of a merchant of Geneva. He was a boy of singular talent and fancy. He loved enterprise, hardship, and even danger for its own sake. 
he was deeply read in books of chivalry and romance. He composed heroic songs and began to write many a tale of enchantment and knightly adventure. He tried to make his act plays and to enter into masquerades, in which the characters were drawn from the heroes of Ronson's Vows, of the Knights of, of the Round Table of King Arthur, and of the chivalrous train who shed their blood to redeem the holy sepulcher from the hands of the infidels. No human being could have passed a happier childhood than myself. My parents were possessed by the very spirit of kindness and indulgence. We felt that they were not the tyrants to rule our lot according to their caprice, but the agents and creators of all the many delights which we enjoyed. When I mingled with other families, I distinctly discerned how peculiarly fortunate my lot was, and gratitude assisted the development of filial love. My temper was sometimes violent, and my passions vehement, but by some law in my temperature they were turned not towards childish pursuits, but to an eager desire to learn, and not to learn all things indiscriminately. I confess that neither the structure of languages, nor the code of governments, nor the politics of various states possessed attractions for me. It was the secrets of heaven and earth that I desired to learn. And whether it was the outward substance of things, or the inner spirit of nature and the mysterious soul of man that occupied me, still my inquiries were directed to the, to the metaphysical, or, in its highest sense, the physical secrets of the world world. Meanwhile, Clerval occupied himself, so to speak, with the moral relations of things. The busy stage of life, the virtues of heroes, and the actions of men were his theme, and his hope and his dream was to become one among those whose names are recorded in history. As the gallant and adventurous benefactors of our species, the saintly soul of Elizabeth shone like a shrine dedicated lamp in our peaceful home. Her sympathy was ours, her smile, her soft voice, the sweet glance of her celestial eyes were ever there to bless and animate us. She was the living spirit of love to soften and attract. I might have become sullen in my study, rough through the ardor of my nature, but that she was there to subdue me to a semblance of her own gentleness. And Clerval, cold, ought ill entrench on the noble spirit of Cler Clerval, yet he might not have been so perfectly humane, so thoughtful in his generosity, so full of kindness and tenderness amidst his passion for adventurous exploit, had she not unfolded to him the real loveliness of beneficence and made the doing good the end and aim of his soaring ambition. I feel exquisite pleasure in dealing on the recollections of childhood, before misfortune had tainted my mind and changed its bright visions of extensive usefulness into gloomy and narrow reflections upon self. Besides, in drawing the picture of my early days, I also record those events which led, by insensible steps, to my aftertale of misery. For when I would account to myself for the birth of that passion which afterwards ruled my destiny, I find it arise like a mountain river from ignoble and almost forgotten sources. But swelling as it proceeded, it became the torrent which, in its course, has swept away all my hopes and joys. Natural philosophy is the genius that has regulated my fate I desire, therefore, in this narration, to state those facts which led to my predilection for that science. When I was thirteen years of age, we all went on a party of pleasure to the baths near Thronon. The inclemency of the weather obliged us to remain a day confined to the inn. In this house I chanced to find a volume of the works of Cornelius Agrippa. I opened it with apathy the theory which he attempts to demonstrate, and the wonderful facts which he relates, soon changed this feeling into enthusiasm. A new light seemed to dawn upon my mind, and, bounding with joy, I communicated my discovery to my father. My father looked carelessly at the title page of my book and said, 
Ah, Cornelius Agrippa, my dear Victor, do not waste your time upon, time upon this. It is sad trash. If, instead of this remark, my father had taken the pains to explain to me that the principles of Agrippa had been entirely exploded, and that a modern system of science had been introduced, which possessed much greater powers than the ancient, because the powers of the latter were chimerical, while those of the former were real and practical, under such circumstances I should certainly have thrown Agrippa aside, and have contended my imagination, warmed it as it was by returning with greater ardour to my former studies. It is even possible that the train of my ideas would never have received the fatal impulse that led to my ruin. But the cursory glance my father had taken of my volume by no means assured me that he was acquainted with its contents, and I continued to read with the greatest avidity. When I returned home, my first care was to procure the whole works of this author, and afterwards of Paracelsus and Albertus Magnus. I read and studied the wild fancies of these writers with delight. They appeared to me treasures known to few beside myself. I have described myself as always having been imbued with a fervent, fervent longing to penetrate the secrets of nature. In spite of the intense labor and wonderful discoveries of modern philosophers, I always came from my studies discontented and unsatisfied. Sir Isaac Newton is said to have avowed that he felt like a child picking up shells beside the great and unexplored ocean of truth. Those of his successors in each branch of natural philosophy with whom I was acquainted appeared even to my boy's apprehensions as Tyros, Tyros engaged in the same pursuit. The untaught peasant beheld the elements around him as one is acquainted with their practical uses. The most learned philosopher knew little more. He had partially unveiled the face of nature, but her immortal lineaments were still a wonder and a mystery. He might dissect, anatomize, and give names, but not to speak of a final cause. Causes in their secondary and tertiary grades were utterly unknown to him. I had gazed upon the fortifications and impediments that seemed to keep human beings from entering the citadel of nature, and rashly and ignorantly I had repined. But here were books, and here were men who had penetrated deeper and knew more. I took their word for all that they averred, and I became their disciple. It may appear strange that such should arise in the eighteenth century, but while I followed the routine of education in the schools of Geneva, I was, to a great degree, self-taught with regard to my favorite studies. My father was not scientific, and I was left to struggle with a child's blindness. Added to a student's thirst for knowledge, under the guidance of my new preceptors, I entered with the greatest diligence into the search of the philosopher's stone and the elixir of life but the latter soon obtained my undivided attention. Wealth was an inferior object, but what glory would attend the discovery if I could banish disease from the human frame and render man invulnerable to any but a violent death? Nor were these my only visions. The raising of ghosts or devils was a promise liberally accorded to my favorite authors, the fulfillment of which I most eagerly sought as if my incantations were always unsuccessful, I attributed the failure rather to my own inexperience and mistake than to a want of skill or fidelity in my instructors. And thus, for a time, I was occupied by exploded systems, mingling like an unadept a thousand contradictory theories, and floundering desperately in a very slough of multifarious knowledge guided by an ardent imagination and childish reasoning, till an accident again changed the current of my ideas. When I was about fifteen years old, we had retired to our house near, near Belle Reve, when we witnessed a most violent and terrible thunderstorm. 
It advanced from behind the mountains of Jura, and the thunder burst at once with frightful loudness from various quarters of the heavens. I remained while the last storm lasted, watching its progress with curiosity and delight. As I stood at the door, on a sudden, I beheld a stream of fire issue from an old and beautiful oak, which stood about twenty yards from our house, and so soon as the dazzling light vanished, the oak had disappeared and nothing remained but a blasted stump. When we visited it the next morning, we found the tree shattered in a singular manner. It was not splintered by the shock, but entirely reduced to thin ribbands of wood. I never beheld anything so utterly destroyed. Before this, I was not unacquainted with the more obvious laws of electricity. On this occasion, a man of great research in natural philosophy was with us, and, excited by this catastrophe, he entered on the explanation of a theory which he had formed on the subject of electricity and galvanism, which was at once new and astonishing to me. All that he said threw greatly into the shade of Cornelius Agrippa, Albertus Magnus, and Paracelsus, the lords of my imagination. But by some fatality, the overthrow of these men disinclined me to pursue my accustomed studies. It seemed to me as if nothing would or could ever be known. All that had so long engaged my attention suddenly grew despicable by one of those caprices of the mind, which we are perhaps most subject to in early youth, I at once gave up my former occupations, set down natural history and all its progeny as a deformed and abortive creation, and entered the greatest disdain for would-be science, which could never even step within the threshold of real knowledge. In this mood of mind, I betook myself to the mathematics and the branches of study appertaining to that science as being built upon secure foundations and so worthy of my consideration. Thus strangely are our souls constructed, and by such slight ligaments are we bound to prosperity or ruin. When I look back, it seems to me as if this almost miraculous change of inclination and will was the immediate suggestion of the guardian angel of my life. The last effort made by the spirit of preservation to avert the storm that was even then hanging in the stars and ready to envelop me. Her victory was announced by an unusual tranquility and gladness of soul, which followed the relinquishing of my ancient and laterally tormenting studies. It was thus that I was to be taught to associate evil with their prosecution, happiness with their disregard. It was a strong effort of the spirit of good, but it was ineffectual. Destiny was too potent, and her immutable laws had decreed my utter and terrible destruction. Chapter 3 When I had attained the age of seventeen, my parents resolved that I should become a student at the University of Ingolstadt. I had hitherto attended the schools of Geneva, but my father thought it necessary for the completion of my education that I should be made acquainted with other customs than those of my native country. My departure was therefore fixed at an early date, but before the day resolved upon could arrive, the first misfortune of my life occurred, an omen, as it were, of my future misery. Elizabeth had caught the scarlet fever, her illness was severe, and she was in the greatest danger. During her illness, many arguments had been urged to persuade my mother to refrain from attending upon her. She had, at first, yielded to our entreaties. But when she heard that the life of her favorite was menaced, she could no longer control her anxiety. She attended her sickbed. Her watchful attentions triumphed over the malignity of the distemper. Elizabeth was saved, but the consequences of this imprudence were fatal to her preserver. On the third day, my mother sickened. Her fever was accompanied by the most alarming symptoms, and the looks of her medical attendants prognosticated the worst event. On her deathbed, the fortitude and benignity of the best, this best of women did not desert her. 
She joined the hands of Elizabeth and myself. My children, she said, my firmest hopes of future happiness were placed on the prospect of your union. This expectation will now be the consolation of your father. Elizabeth, my love, you must supply my place to my younger children. Alas, I regret that I am taken from you. And happy and beloved as I have been, it is not hard to quit is it not hard to quit you all? But these are not thoughts befitting me. I will endeavor to resign myself cheerfully to death, and will indulge a hope of meeting you in another world. She died calmly, and her countenance expressed affection even in death. I need not describe the feelings of those whose dearest ties are rent by that most irreparable evil, the void that presents itself to the soul, and the despair that is exhibited on the countenance. It is so long before the mind can persuade itself that she, whom we saw every day, and whose very existence appeared a part of our own, can have departed forever. That the brightness of a beloved eye can have been extinguished, and the sound of a voice so familiar and dear to the ear can be hushed, never more to be heard. These are the reflections of the first days, but when the lapse of time proves the reality of the evil, then the actual bitterness of grief commences. Yet from whom has not that rude hand rent away some dear connection? And why should I describe a sorrow which all have felt and must feel? The time at length arrives when grief is rather an indulgence than a necessity. And the smile that plays upon the lips, although it may be deemed a sacrilege, is not banished. My mother was dead, but we, still, we had still duties which we ought to perform. We must continue our course with the rest, and learn to think ourselves fortunate whilst one remains whom the spoiler has not seized. My departure for Ingolstadt, which had been deferred by these events, was now again determined upon. I obtained from my father a, a respite of some weeks. It appeared to me sacrilege so soon to leave the repose akin to death of the house of mourning, and to rush into the thick of life. I was new to sorrow, but it did not the less alarm me. I was unwilling to quit the sight of those that remained to me, and above all, I desired to see my sweet Elizabeth in some degree consoled. She indeed veiled her grief, and strove to act the comforter to us all. She looked steadily on life, and assumed its duties with courage and zeal. She devoted herself to those whom she had been taught to call her uncle and cousins. Never was she so enchanting as at this time, when she recalled the sunshine of her smiles and spent them upon us. She forgot even her own regret in her endeavors to make us forget. The day of my departure at length arrived. Clerval spent the last evening with us. He had endeavored to persuade his father to permit him to accompany me and to become my fellow student, but in vain. His father was a narrow-minded trader and saw idleness and ruin in the aspirations and ambition of his son. Henry deeply felt the misfortune of being debarred from a liberal education. He said little, but when he spoke... I read in his kindling eye and in his animated glance a restrained but firm resolve not to be chained to the miserable details of commerce. We sat late. We could not tear ourselves away from each other, nor persuade ourselves to say the word farewell. It was said, and we retired under, under the pretense of seeking repose, each fancying that the other was deceived. But when at morning's dawn I descended to the carriage which was to convey me away, they were all there. My father again to bless me, Clerval to press my hand once more, my Elizabeth to renew my her entreaties that I would write often, and to bestow the last feminine attentions on her playmate and friend. I threw myself into the chase and was to convey that was to convey me away, and indulged in the most melancholy reflections. I, who had never been surrounded, ever been surrounded by amiable companions, continually engaged in endeavoring to bestow mutual pleasure, I was now alone. 
in the university, whither I was going, I must form my own friends and be my own protector. My life had hitherto been remarkably secluded and domestic, and this had given me invincible repugnance to new countenances. I loved my brothers, Elizabeth and Clerval. These were old familiar faces, but I believed myself totally unfitted for the company of strangers. Such were my reflections as I commenced my journey, but as I proceeded, my spirits and hopes rose. I ardently desired the acquisition of knowledge. I had often, when at home, thought it hard to remain during my youth cooped up in one place, and had longed to enter the world and take my station among other human beings. Now my desires were complied with, and it would indeed have been folly to repent. I had sufficient leisure for these and many other reflections during my journey to Ingolstadt, which was long and fatiguing. At length, the high white steeple of the town met my eyes. I alighted and was conducted to my solitary apartment to spend the evening as I pleased. The next morning, I delivered my letters of introduction and paid a visit to some of the principal professors. Chance, or rather the evil influence, the angel of destruction, which asserted omnipotent sway over me from the moment I turned my reluctant steps from my father's door, led me first to Mr. Crumpy, professor of natural philosophy. He was an uncouth man, but deeply imbued in the secrets of his science. He asked me several questions concerning my progress in the different branches of science appertaining to natural philosophy. I replied carelessly and partly in contempt, mentioned the names of my alchemists as the principal authors I had studied. The professor stared. Have you, he said, really spent your time in studying such nonsense? I replied in the affirmative. Every minute. Every minute, continued M. Mr. Crumpy, with warmth. Every instant that you have wasted on those books is utterly and entirely lost. You have burdened your memory with exploded systems and useless names. Good God! In what desert land have you lived, where no one was kind enough to inform you that these fancies, which you have so greedily imbibed, are a thousand years old and as musty as they are ancient? I expected little in this enlightened and scientific age to find a disciple of Albertus Magnus and Paracelsus. My dear, you must begin your studies entirely anew. So, stay, so saying, he stepped aside and wrote down a list of several books treating of natural philosophy, which he desired me to procure, and dismissed me after mentioning that in the beginning of the following week he intended to commence a course of lectures upon natural philosophy in its general, general relations, and that Mr. Waldman, a fellow professor, would lecture upon chemistry the alternate days that he omitted. I returned home not disappointed, for I have said that I had long considered those authors useless whom the professor reprobated, but I returned, not at all with the more inclined, to recur to these studies in any shape. Mr. Crimpy was a squat little man, with a gruff voice and a repulsive countenance. The teacher, therefore, did not prepossess me in favor of his pursuits. In rather a too philosophical too philosophical and connected a strain, perhaps. I have given a, an account of the conclusions I had come to concerning them in my early years. As a child, I had not been content with the results promised by the modern professors of natural science, with a confusion of ideas only to be accounted for by my extreme youth and my want of a guide on such matters. I had retrod the steps of knowledge along the paths of time, and exchanged the discoveries of recent inquirers for the dreams of forgotten alchemists. Besides, I had a contempt for the uses of modern natural philosophy. It was very different when the masters of the science sought immortality and power. Such views, although futile, were grand, but now the scene was changed. The ambition of the inquirer seemed to limit itself to the annihilation of those visions on which my interest in science was chiefly founded. 
I was required to exchange chimeras of boundless grandeur for realities of little worth. Such were my reflections during the first two or three days of my residence at Ingolstadt, which were chiefly spent in becoming acquainted with the localities and the principal residents in my new abode. But as the ensuing week commenced, I thought of the information which Mr. Crump had given me concerning the lectures, and although I could not consent and to go and hear that little conceited fellow deliver sentences out of a pulpit, I recollected what he had said of Mr. Waldman, whom I had never seen, as he had hitherto been out of town. Partly from curiosity and partly from idleness, I went into the lecturing room which Mr. Waldman entered shortly after. This professor was very unlike his colleague. He appeared about fifty years of age, but with an aspect expressive of the greatest benevolence. A few gray hairs covered his temples, but those at the back of his head were nearly black. His person was short, but remarkably erect, and his voice the sweetest I had ever heard. He began his lecture by a recapitulation of the history of chemistry and the various improvements made by different men of learning, pronouncing with fervor the names of the most distinguished discoverers. He then took a cursory view of the present state of the science, and explained many of its elementary terms. After having made a few preparatory experiments, he concluded with a panegyric upon modern chemistry, the terms of which I shall never forget. The ancient teachers of this science, said he, promised impossibilities and performed nothing. The modern masters promised very little. They know that metals cannot be transmuted, and that the elixir of life is a chimera. But these philosophers, whom hands seem only made to dabble in dirt, and their eyes to pour over the microscope or crucible, have indeed performed miracles. They penetrate into the recesses of nature and show how she works in her hiding places. They ascend into the heavens. They have discovered how the blood circulates, and the nature of the air we breathe. They have acquired new and almost unlimited powers. They can command the thunders of heaven, mimic the earthquake, and even mock the invisible world with its own shadows. Such were the professor's words. Rather, let me say, such the words of fate, announced to destroy me. As he went on, I felt as if my soul were grappling with a palpable enemy. One by one, the various keys were touched, which formed the mechanism of my being. Chord after chord was sounded, and soon my mind was filled with one thought. One conception, one purpose. So much has been done, exclaimed the soul of Frankenstein. More, far more will I achieve, treading in the steps already marked. I will pioneer a new way, explore unknown powers, and unfold to the world the deepest mysteries of creation. I closed not my eyes that night. My internal being was in a state of insurrection and turmoil. I felt that order would thence arise, but I had no power to produce it. By degrees, after the morning's dawn, sleep came. I awoke, and my yesternight's thoughts were as a dream. There only remained a resolution to return to my ancient studies and to devote myself to a science for which I believed myself to possess a natural talent. On the same day, I paid Mr. Waldman a visit. His manners in private were even more mild and attractive than in public, for there was a certain dignity in his mien during his lecture, which in his own house was replaced by the greatest affability and kindness. I gave him pretty nearly the same account of my former pursuits as I had given his fellow professor. He heard with attention the little narration concerning my studies, and smiled at the names of Cornelius Agrippa and Paracelsus, but without the contempt that Mr. Kemp had exhibited. He said that these were men whose indefatigable zeal modern philosophers were indebted for most of the foundations of their knowledge. They had left to us, as an easier task, to give new names and arrange in connected classifications the facts 
which they, in de great degree, had been the instruments of bringing to light. The labors of men of genius, however erroneously directed, scarcely ever fail in ultimately turning to the solid advantage of mankind. I listened to his statement, which was delivered without any presumption or affectation, and then added that his lecture had removed my prejudices against modern chemists. I express, expressed myself in measured terms, with the modesty and deference due from a youth to his instructor. Without letting escape, inexperience in life would have made me ashamed, any of the enthusiasm which stimulated my intended labors. I requested his advice concerning the books I ought to procure. I am happy, said Mr. Waldman, to have gained a disciple, and if your application equals your ability, I have no doubt of your success. Chemistry is that branch of natural philosophy in which the greatest improvements have been made and may be made. It is on that account that I have made it my peculiar study, but at the same time I have not neglected the other branches of science. A man would make but a very sorry chemist if he attended to that department of human knowledge alone. If your wish is to become a, really a man of science, and not merely a petty experimentalist, I should advise you to apply to every branch of natural philosophy, including mathematics. He then took me into his laboratory and explained to me the uses of his various machines, instructing me as to what I ought to procure and promising me the use of his own when I should have advanced far enough in the science not to derange their mechanism. He also gave me the list of books which I had requested, and I took my leave. Thus ended a day memorable to, memorable to me. It decided my future destiny.